we are starting a new series called Thrive. And we're going to be looking at how do you thrive in your relationships in the future? How do, you, how do you thrive with your finances? How do you thrive even in the midst of your failures? I don't think oftentimes we think about the fact that it is possible to thrive through life's struggles. We have these high points, and that's kind of where we sit in life. We think this is what it's all about. But with our ups and downs that we go through in life, we really do have the ability to thrive through all of those moments. And as I've been processing what does it mean to thrive, for me, I have to look at myself first as an individual. And I have to ask myself, if I'm going to thrive, then I really believe that I have to find who the authentic me is, who the authentic you is. How do we find that person? How do we get to that place of looking at who is the authentic me? You see, what happens as we go through life, as we're dealing with who we are, as we're growing, as, as we're living we're beginning to emulate as we grow. We see other people and how they live. And we think to ourselves, you know, if I'm going to thrive with my life, then maybe I need to become like them because they're really funny and, and popular and that, that would help me thrive. Or if I'm going to thrive, I'm going to see that person, I'm going to be successful and I want to be just like them or I want to be like this person. So we, end, we spend our time bouncing from person to person emulating them, becoming them, and before we know it, we're this hood rat where we don't even recognize who we are anymore because we're so many different people, we've lost ourselves. You see, when you find your authentic self, when you get to that place, when you're diving deep into who you are, the problem is we listen to the lies that society and people tells us that we need to become now, it's okay, don't get me wrong, it's okay to follow into, in somebody's footsteps. It's okay to try to emulate somebody you respect. It's okay to have somebody pouring into your life, but it's not okay when you lose your authentic you. And so I was processing through, like, what does that mean? You see, we pursue all these other things, as I said, but we lose ourselves. We lose who we are. There's a verse I continually go back to in almost everything I do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul. And as I was processing through that, realizing that who I am is my heart and my mind. That makes me uniquely me. It makes you uni uniquely you. Your thoughts, your patterns, how you go through life, your thinking. My soul, that's that eternal story of who I become. And my body... I think in my early days, I think that, you know, this, my body is all that matters. And then as you age in your 40s, you're like, my body's okay. And then in your 50s, you're like, I think I'm almost dead. <laughs> Buddy of mine sent me a picture this weekend. Uh, he said it was a picture of like a Band-Aid. Put the Band-Aid where, where it hurts. And when you're over 50, it's just an entire Band-Aid. It's just covering your whole body. And so then you have to wrestle with, okay, who is the authentic me? Because I've been so focused on the physical side of myself that I need to now figure out who I really am. About two, three years ago, I got this phone. And when I got this phone, they had the new facial recognition. Because apparently we're too lazy to just swipe. Now we have to look at it and hold it perfect. But COVID was difficult because when I would look at it, it wouldn't recognize me. So I'd be in the store. Instead of pushing the little numbers to unlock it, I would look around. I'd pull my mask back, and I'd look at it, and it would open, and I'd go about my day. A couple years ago, I turned 50, somewhere in there. And something happens when you turn 50. Like, not only does your body drastically begin to age rapidly, but for some reason, you become obsessed with the weather. I don't know why. We live in Phoenix, it's sunny for the next 3,000 years, and yet every single morning I have to look up and go, what's the weather going to be like today? <laughs> Here's what happened though, over the last month, uh, over the last year or so, I wake up, the first thing I do is I grab my phone, and I look at it because I'm too lazy to push the code in, and it does the facial recognition, and the lock unlocks, and then it locks again. So I shift the camera a little bit, and it unlocks, and it locks again. So then I'll try to smooth out my face, and it unlocks and it locks again. And what my phone is saying is I used to know who you are, but in the last couple of years I've lost whoever that is inside, because you don't look the same. You've got these bags underneath your eyes. You know when you walk up to somebody that's like famous or respected, and you, you finally see them up close, and it's one of those things where it's like, whoa. Like you don't look like that from a distance. That's what happens to all of us. 
And my phone is this constant reminder of your body is just temporary. And it is not going to be what lasts. It is not going to be the story that people hold on to. If I'm going to find the authentic me, then I have to look inside of myself at my heart and my mind. And I have to think about the things that I'm putting into myself. And I have to look at how I'm interacting with people. And at some point, I have to wrestle with who I am authentically. Because not only is my phone telling me I don't know who you are, but oftentimes you'll see friends or people that you know and you're like, I, I, don't, I don't know what happened to them. I don't know who they are anymore. So as I look at who the authentic you is, who the authentic me is, in order to thrive, I have to become in that place where my heart and my mind are stepping in junction with where God is leading me. One of the passages I've been reading lately is Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read it slowly and just ingest this in. It says, those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God. Ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing, and God isn't pleased at being ignored. The line in there where it says obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. It talks about how we use our own moral muscle. You see, we go through life, I think a lot of us knowing who God is, but then when it says to allow him to completely come in and control who you are, and yet in my own moral muscle, I have this tendency to keep my hands out, to continue to build these walls and these barriers and this false persona of telling people, I'm okay, I'm good. You know, I've had a friend way back in the day, my wife and I were struggling financially, uh, and he came over and he's, he was doing well in his life, he's a really good friend, and he says, hey, I'd like to bless you guys today, I want to pay your rent, and I want to give you guys some food, and I, and I just looked at him and I said, we're good. He says, Paul, you don't understand, I feel like God has called me over here to bless you guys, and I said, look, we're going to be good, we're fine. And then he stopped, he looked at me, he goes, you're robbing my blessing, he goes, I feel that God literally brought me to your house to bless you. And you're taking that away from me because of my pride was too big to say, you know, thank you. It was, I got this. Don't worry. You see, myself and the outside me, I always want to come across as everything's okay, everything's good. Don't worry about it. Three years, three, four years ago, I was doing push-ups because I was trying to hold on to my youth. And at about push-up number 14, my shoulder kind of cracked, and I thought that didn't sound good. So the next day, I did push-ups again, and at push-up number three, it cracked again. The next day, I, I, I put my hand on the ground and went, nope, I'm done. And over the next couple months, like everything, my shoulders, when I'd swing a hammer, it would hurt. When I was doing, it was just constantly hurting. I was talking to a guy once, and it literally, like I'm standing like this, and my shoulder popped out and then back in. I wasn't moving. I wasn't doing anything. I was just aging rapidly in that moment. <laughs> and I'm like, how does, how does your shoulder pop out when you do nothing? Like literally, <clears throat> and then I fell on the ground. He's like, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, it's just an aggressive move on my part. My bad. And so my wife kept saying to me, you need to go see a doctor. And I kept saying to her, I'm fine. It's not that bad. <laughs> and at one point, she left me. She's like, not left, left me, but she's left me on the ground like, that's your fault. You know what to do. Go to the doctor. Get it fixed. The Lord made people that are a lot smarter than you that understand what's on the inside of your body. So I get an appointment with my physician, physician's assistant. I go in and I tell him, I think my arm's falling off my body. And he says, well, let's look on the inside. And so he sent me, and we got an x-ray. And he looked at the x-ray, and he goes, it looks like you have a bone spur. He goes, but you probably should go see a different doctor. So he sent me to this other doctor. 
A couple weeks later, I see the doctor. He comes in, and he goes, yeah, you've got more than a bone spur. You've got all kinds of stuff. He goes, did you ever hurt yourself? I'm like, I'm a very unintelligent man. Like, do you really think I haven't hurt myself? I said, let's think. I, I crashed my bike. I jumped off a roof. I fell off a roof. I dislocated in football. I dislocated at rock climbing. I mean, I could keep going on a, for a lot of different things. He goes, yeah, you got a lot of tears, a lot of things in your shoulder. He goes, you need, we need to look deeper. He goes, I'm going to send you and go get an MRI. So I got the MRI. I come back to the doctor. He said, yeah, you, you've, yeah, mm. He goes, you need to go see a different doctor. <laughs> I'm like, do, do any of you guys finish your training or you just get to a certain point and say, you know, I'm good here. And so he sends me to the surgeon. And the surgeon walks in, and I love surgeons because they have no like, bedside manner. It's just, hi, you're broken, bye. <laughs> and so the surgeon walked in, and he goes, hello, I'm going to look at your scans. I'll be right back. And he leaves the room. And I'm not kidding you, 30 seconds to a minute later, he walks back in. He says, you need a complete shoulder replacement. I'm like, you were gone for 30 seconds. You couldn't find that all out in 30 seconds. He goes, your arthritis in your shoulder is so bad that it's like, it's like done. There's nothing we can do to fix it. I'm like, stitch it. Do a couple like arthroscopic, something like that. He goes, it won't help. He goes, it's literally, there's nothing we can do. And I looked at him, I'm like, aren't like shoulder and hip replacements for like old people? He didn't say anything, he just went. <laughs> Noted, thank you for the constant reminder. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I think I'm good. And I got up and I walked out. And I thought, you know what? That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'll be fine. I'm just going to pray harder. And so I started praying for my shoulder that it would heal itself. You see, what I realized, when we have people that actually can see inside of us and they can see our soul and our heart and our mind and our thoughts and they know us so intimately that they can look and say, there's something wrong with you. You've changed You've lost the authentic you. And yet, from the outside, we still have this endless battle of pushing people away and hiding who we are on the inside because we don't want people to know that inside we're hurting and broken. Probably about five, six years ago, I started this quest to kind of figure out who I was deeper inside of me. And so one of the books I read was a book called Scary Clothes by Donald Miller. And when he wrote this book, he was writing, the, the subtitle is Dropping the Act and Finding True Intimacy. He says he had just gotten engaged and he realized his entire life, he had lived the same way, way where he kept everyone at a distance and those that kind of got close, he used humor and other things to mask it so that they wouldn't know who he really was. He says, if I'm going to get married, I want my wife to know who the authentic me is, not just on the outside, but on the inside. And so he checked into this place called Onsite, which is in Tennessee, and it's a, it's a one-week to one-month treatment center where you go in and it's deep counseling and therapy. And so he walked in, and when he got there, he said, they take away the phone, and you're only allowed to use your first name. You can't tell anybody what you do for a living. You can't tell anybody your last name. You can't tell anything, the things that you normally tell people. My line is, hey, my name is Paul. Yeah, I used to be in the music business. I have a couple platinum albums. I mean, I was kind of a pretty big deal, but you know. And that's that fake thing where I'm like, it just makes me popular. It just makes me known. It gives me street cred. But when you walk in here, they're like, you have to leave all of that behind. So he said on the first day, he was talking to his therapist. And he's, he's talking, and he's being funny, and the counselor stopped him, and he goes, I, I know who you are. He's like, what do you mean? He goes, you use humor to mask who you really are. He says, what are you talking about? So he drew this little circle on this napkin. And in the circle, he wrote the word self. He said, all of us, all of us are born in God's image. All of us were born these beautiful creations in the image of our parents, but in the image of who God made us. He goes, and then as we grow, something happens. Some failures or some flaws come out, some bullying, parents get separated, divorced, you have to move suddenly. All these things happen and it affects us. He goes, then he drew another circle. He goes, there's shame that enters into your life that you can't get rid of. And I really, as I was reading that, I thought about that. 
That shame that, what is the shame that I carry around? What is the thing that I hide from people? And I remember as an eighth grader when I moved back to the United States from overseas, that whole year and a half following was all shame. It was all just pain and struggle and just trying to fit in and trying to figure out life and, and wondering why am I back in this situation? And I remember from that point on, I covered it and I buried it. With, with being funny, with trying to be successful, with trying to be known. And I'm relating as Donna Miller speaking to him, he draws another circle. He goes, what we do then is we create our false self. And that false self is what you're presenting to the world. He said, and that false self is what you are using to go through life so that you're safe and secure and you're not having to hide or you're, you're hiding all of those wounds deep within us. That lie that says, I only matter if I become successful. I only matter if I'm known. I only matter if I'm good looking or if I'm smart or if I, if I have a certain amount of followers. Who is the authentic you? See, at some point we have to look through those circles and get to the very beginning of that and wonder who is the, who is the authentic you? He went on to say, he says, the inner self, that inner circle, gives and receives love. He goes, but those two outer circles, those two are just theater. It's just this false persona that you're putting off everywhere you go. Two, three years ago, we did a series on the book, uh, The Road Back to You, and as I was looking at who I was on the outside and how I was going through life, I realized the authentic me is ultimately found inside of me. And I was reading this book, The Road Back to You by Ian Morgan Cron, and it talks about nine different personality types, and these nine different personality types are all different images of who God is, and we all reflect that image of God, but we gravitate towards certain ones. And in the book, it was talking about the wounds that we carry. It talks about who the childlike form is inside of you. And I was just kind of fascinated reading about how we are all differently, but yet kind of the same. And then I read through the chapter where I realized, oh my word, they're writing about me right now. And it was just, it was the weirdest experience. And then it said, here's who these people are as kids, and here's what happened to them, and here's the things that they struggle with. And I read that paragraph and instantly shut the book and just started to weep. I'm like, it's like they just ripped out my soul and put it in this book and they said, here's what Paul struggles with. Here, read this chapter. And I was embarrassed because my thought was, people are going to see who I am deep inside of me. But if I'm going to be the authentic me, I have to be able to wrestle through who the inside version of myself is. In Romans chapter 8, that passage goes on and it says this. It says, but if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the spirit of Christ, won't know what we are talking about but for you who welcome him in, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, go back. <laughs> when God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be alive as Christ. That line where it says, when God lives and breathes in you, you are delivered from that dead life. You think about that, the, the, the dead life. Go ahead and go to that next slide. Looking at who you are and thriving with the authentic me, the line in that passage where it says he's taken up residence in your life. When I was in third grade, I was standing outside. We were in Bainbridge Island. My parents owned five acres. They bought it for 24000 side note. It's now worth $1.9 They sold it for like 30000 Story of our life. But when he... When we lived there, I don't, I don't know where that came from, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I remember as a third grader, I'm standing out in the acreage, and I'm by this trailer, and I remember thinking, I don't think I've ever accepted Jesus into my heart. Dear Jesus, please come into my heart. Amen. Then I'm like, okay, I'm good. And I remember going into my parents' house, and I said, hey, I just accept Jesus into my heart. I'm going to see you in heaven. Can I go play? And for years, that was my relationship. Well, I asked him into my heart, and so I'm good. And yet when it says here, when God has taken up residence in your life. In my early 30s, late 20s, I was meeting with a group of guys, friends of mine, and we started wrestling through, okay, what does faith mean to us? As men, as parents, as fathers, like, who are the, what are we supposed to be like? And it was, honestly, it was this dive of looking at, okay, who, who are we authentically? And so we started challenging each other to not only just have that, that, hey, will you come into my life, but it's that, will you take up residence in my life? Will you allow, the, I'm allowing you to come and take over all of me. And the prayer that we prayed was, God, will you flip my life upside down? And I remember one of our guys, he's like, I'm not going to say that. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I'm not going to pray that prayer. I'm like, why, why wouldn't you pray that prayer? Why wouldn't you pray that God controls, has all of your life? He goes, because I know I'll probably lose my job. I have, I'm making really good money. I have a really nice house. And I know God is real, but I'm going to keep it surface. And you know what? He still lives in that house. He still has that same job. I'm not going to say he's wrong. It's probably going to go to heaven. I'm not God. I don't know any of those things. But I look at how he's lived. And not that I've lived a better life. But I don't want to live the safe life. And I look at that moment on is when I said, okay, take up residence. You see, what we do oftentimes is when we feel like God is calling us or leading us or asking us, we start running. And we start pushing him to a side and, and we say, no, I know best. I know, I know how to get through this. And when a hardship happens, well, all I need to do is work harder. Or all I need to do is just these certain things and I'll be good. In reality, God is saying sometimes, I just need you to turn it over to me and trust. Probably about six months ago, my shoulder still hurt. And it hurt a lot worse than it was three years before. So I was sitting right over here, and I was talking with one of our doctors that I brought to Malawi with me several times, and he's a really, really respected doctor. And I said, look, you know people. Can you find me the best shoulder surgeon in Arizona? I said, forget that. Can you find me the best shoulder surgeon in America? He's like, well, I can find you somebody that I think is pretty good. Let me ask around. So he asks around. And a week later, he sends me this picture. He goes, I've done some research. This guy is pretty much the best surgeon in Arizona. I don't know if he's the best in America, but he's one of the best for shoulders in Arizona. So I looked him up. I read his whatever that thing is, all the stuff he's done. And I could tell he's clearly a lot smarter than me. And so I called, and I got an appointment, and I went, and I sat in the room. And I'm sitting there waiting for him to room, walk in. And all of a sudden, here walks in the guy that told me I needed a shoulder replacement. And I just kind of looked at him, I'm like, is this your office? Like, are, are you in the wrong place or am I in the wrong place? Because I feel like you are. And he just looked at me, he goes, you ready to finally get your shoulder replaced? And I said, no. But if you're saying that's the only thing I can do, he goes, your shoulder's done. And so then I was able to have a conversation with him of, explain this to me. And he shows me the MRIs and he shows me all these different things of why my shoulder is beyond repair. So I booked the surgery April 9th, eight weeks ago, seven weeks ago. He does a complete shoulder replacement. Here's what it looks like now. You can call me the winter soldier. <laughs> and so afterwards, on my first follow-up appointment, he shows me this x-ray, so I take a picture of it. And I'm like, it looks pretty good. Like, how do you know I really, like when you, I was still doubting. I said, when you got in there, did you, did you really like, yep, this was the right thing? Or did you think, ah, we shouldn't have probably done this? He goes, look, 
And I apologize for the graphicness. He goes, when you cut apart a chicken and you see the chicken bone, he goes, that white part of the chicken bone, that's what your shoulder's supposed to look like. Yours was completely blown up. He goes, yours looked like the moon meets Mars meets like artichokes. He goes, it was unbelievable. It was unreal. And I just sat there and I said, and again, so you're sure you did the right thing. (laughs) You see, when we have people that have our best interest, that know us at our core, that can challenge us. If I wanna become the authentic me, then I have to allow those people I trust to speak truth into my life. Since that moment of God turned my life upside down, I've made it almost mandatory that I constantly have men speaking into my life that are speaking truth. Because my mind likes to wander and I love going on adventures and I can get lost quick. And they'll say to me, Paul, you need to come back. When you're searching for the authentic you, the authentic version of who you are, I I really honestly believe the first step is turning your life over to God. And not just, hey, can I get to heaven? But come and take residence in my life. Brene Brown wrote a book last book. If you want to get any of these books, there's this new website, Amazon. They'll actually send it to your house. It's fantastic. Uh, the Gifts of Imper- Imperfection, the subtitle is Let Go of Who You Think You're Supposed to Be and Embrace Who You Are. And in it, she says this. She says, authenticity is the daily practice of letting go of who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. Letting go of who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who who we are. Who is the authentic you? Like when you boil it all down, when you strip everything away, when it's just you in a room and your thoughts and your mind and your heart, who's the authentic you? Last week I was processing through this over and over and over again and I really had to ask the question, like who, and it it took a while to like really kind of start stripping all of that away. Who is the authentic me? There's a passage in Psalms 139 and I use this as a prayer oftentimes and it says this, just, just listen, God I invite your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me through and through. Find out everything that may be hidden within me. Put me to the test and sift through all of my anxious cares. See if there is any path of pain I'm walking on. And lead me back to your glorious, everlasting way, the path that brings me back to you. All of us in our authentic self are made in God's image. It talks in in scripture about how we are made in his image, but we're also his workmanship. And that word is translated as a, literally as a piece of work or a piece of art. And when you get to the point where you finally start to realize that my my life is flawed, but at my core, I'm made in God's image. I'm made this beautiful creation. I'm made to go and live and change the world. I'm made with the purpose of following God and allowing him to come and take residence up in my life. But we spend it with our arms out, building walls, putting this false self of who we are You know, when you meet that person and you say, I just love them because they're authentic. But then you hang out with them for a while and you realize, I can't hang out with them. They're too authentic. (laughs) I think what God is calling us to do is say, you know what, here's who I am in my soul, in my heart, in my mind. And God, I need you to continually change me to make me in your image. To not run from that, but to understand that's the truth and how I was created. And for some reason along the way, I lost that and I forgot that. And God, bring me back. Because the authentic you and the authentic me is this beautiful, life, global changing creation where each of us have these unique values and these unique gifts. And God is saying, I'm begging you, come back to me. Allow me to take residence within you. I'll close with this. Close your eyes. I'm going to read this passage again, and we'll close with this as a prayer. God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me through and through. Find out everything that may be hidden within me. 
Put me to the test and sift through all of my anxious cares. See if there's any path of pain I'm walking on. And lead me back to your glorious, everlasting way. The path that brings me back to you. Amen.